breakout groups. Um, I will give you more information on those five breakout groups when we come to that segment. From 1610 to 1612, we will have a short musical break where you can stand up and you'll hear a little bit of music. From 1612 to 1632, we will have a plenary where um, Rachel will also moderate and will get feedback from each of the facilitators of the five groups, four minutes each, um, giving their key messages from those sessions. So that'll be a 40 minute group work. And then we will have 15 minutes from 1632 to 1647. And that will be the question and answer session. So we would appreciate if you could put your questions in the chat box later. And we will have that question and answer session where uh, Rachel will take those questions from the chat box. And then, sorry about that. And then we will do an evaluation and then we will have closing remarks by Sophia Katib Grundy, who's the deputy coordinator with the GPC. So a few of housekeeping rules before we move to our first speaker. Unless you are a speaker, we'd appreciate if you could keep your microphone on mute due to connectivity and bandwidth issues. Um, this would be well appreciated. Um, our speakers will be given five minutes for their presentations and there will be a 40 minute breakout session. And this session will be recorded and available on the GPC website. And there will be a Q and A session where the questions will be put on the chat box and the moderator will be taking those questions for the session. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Bruno Donat, who is the Mine Action Area of Responsibility Coordinator and the head of the UNMAS office in Geneva. Bruno, over to you. Thank you very much, Nancy. I hope you see and hear me. Yes, we do, Bruno, over to you. Thank you so much. So I've been asked to uh, offer some opening remarks, which I'm uh, honored and glad to do. Why me? I'm not sure, but I'm the global coordinator of the MAOR. Little bit about me, I've worked in humanitarian issues, on development, on peace, just back from the Congo, and I see the, uh, another speaker is from the Congo. And uh, I've also recently looked into, from the field perspective, working on nexus issues. And in my experience, I also come with a heading, a stabilization unit in a conflict setting. So today we are very pleased to, to welcome you to this uh, session, um, which is, collective protection outcomes through the nexus. This session has been, as Nancy mentioned, jointly organized by the GPC Strategic Advisory Group, Ch Child Protection, Gender-Based Violence, Housing, Land and Property, and Mine Action of Responsibility, AORs. And we really want to try to bring together partners, service providers, academics and donors to hear from you. I can see that we've been joined by 40 plus of you already, and we are very pleased about this. And of course, uh, we know that we are in that strange period of the COVID-19 pandemic that impacts uh, protection concerns, uh, concerns further in humanitarian crises, and of course, exposes vulnerable populations to new threats. And I think it's so timely now that we have this discussion to kind of deliver better on our commitment to, I would say, the main theme, the centrality of protection, and to advocate alongside uh, other crisis affected communities to ensure better protection outcomes. The way this session is organized is to hear views and I would imagine, as I offer my opening remarks, to see complementarity, to see how we can work better. Oftentimes, I come from the field also, we want to pull the sheet towards us, whether it is peace, humanitarian development, 
and sometimes it has to do with the bottom line of budgets and monies. One key message I have for you as we open these discussions is to think about priorities and sequencing of events and organizational matters. Of course, we can draw from what was discussed at the World Humanitarian Summit we know we have the IASC um, light guidance uh, definition of collective outcomes and most of at least uh, my field colleagues are uh, used to the IASC protection policy that calls for mobilizing other actors to contribute to collective protection outcomes. All I want to say is enjoy the conversations as I often say, we have two ears, one mouth. So let's try to listen twice more than we do speak. With that, I wish you a good conference. My apologies to the organizers. I may not stick to till the end, but I will try to and have a very good session today. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno, for that extraordinarily warm welcome to all the participants. Um, so, crisis and fragility are the most pressing uh, development challenge in this decade for action. Um, about 2.3 billion people will be living in these contexts by 2030. They're already home to 95% of the world's food insecure, 76.5% of the world's extremely poor, and 13.5 million refugees call these places home. We must do better in crisis situations if we are to leave no one behind. That's why in January 2019, the uh, OECD Development Assistance Committee, which brings together all the traditional donors, developed a recommendation on the Nexus, which was then signed immediately by all the donors and now has also been signed by UNDP, WFP, UNICEF, IOM and World Vision. Now we're going to hear from one of those donors, Kirsten Lindig Kallström, who is the first secretary of the Swedish embassy in DRC based in Kinshasa. She's doing tremendous work down there leading the donor group on the Nexus. So over to you, Kirsten, for a donor perspective on the Nexus. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. This is, uh, I'm very pleased to be here, both as a representative of the DRC, but also because before I dove headfirst into the Nexus, I was in fact an interagency coordinator with UNHCR doing a lot of the protection coordinator that many of the coordination that many of the participants today are doing. So I'm quite happy to be here. I'm very honored to be asked um, uh, to, to give a few welcoming or opening words. Just to start, Rachel was telling us a little bit about the um, uh, OECD DAC recommendation. And I think uh, we can proudly say as Sweden that we've taken this very seriously. We have uh, created, in fact, out in some of the most complex uh, countries like the DRC, dedicated positions to try to make this work. Now, what does that mean for us? What do we exactly try to do? What it means is that we try to work both internally on aligning our programs to the humanitarian development and peace nexus, but also that we try to take on as much as we can a leading, a leading role as coordinators and a leading role in the policy discussion around what this actually means in practice. Because it is very clearly one thing to talk about the need of working together and clearly a whole other thing for the multiple partners that operate in these complex contexts to actually find the intersections. So I'm just going to share with you a little bit of the process that we've gone through here in the DRC. It's been um, since the middle of last year, where we, together with the OECD, tried to launch a collective outcomes process. And part of that, of course, included the massively complicated questions of protection issues in a country where conflict is recurrent, displacement is recurrent, and we are also host to a large number of refugees from the neighboring countries in a country where, in fact, the situation for the local population is already uh, in a dire, st uh, dire state and we have just recently seen food insecurity numbers increase again since last year. So just to give you a little bit 
uh, on what we've done on protection and the nexus in general. I'm looking to the side to see my notes to make sure I don't forget anything important. But on protection and the nexus in general, we've talked a lot about the importance of durable solutions. Now, how to define this? Of course, if you are a hardcore protection person, I remember when I was at UNHCR, we're very, we have very strict definitions of what actually is included in the concept of durable solutions. I think here we've tried to modernize a little bit this view and try to move away from the fact that we're talking either resettle, resettlement or citizenship in the sense that you have um, a number of people with protection concerns that in fact are being integrated into the local communities in one way or the other, even if we have a lot left to learn and to change with regard to accessibility to their rights. But for example, in the DRC, in fact, a lot of the same rights are um, also presented to the displaced populations. And so we've tried to take it a step further, modernize a little bit how we define it and look at um, interventions that establish a, an environment that is conducive to the integration or the growth of populations. This is not a straightforward exercise in a country that has no governance structures. Most of the population live in, live in extreme poverty and many um, human rights violations take place on a regular basis. And so it's become really a discussion on how to, how to find a balance between what we as humanitarians refer to as protection and what our development human rights oriented or uh, colleagues refer to as human rights and, and the type of institutions that are required to uphold those rights. And so we've stay, taken quite a bit of time to look, uh, to look at those questions and we've also tried really to bring the different actors closer together and to realize that we can not even in countries with weak governance in fact allow ourselves to create parallel systems that substitute the state, but we have to rather share the information and the analysis on needs that we see with our development partner, with our de the development actor partners and trying to better understand how we can institutionalize the response to some of those needs. This is hugely complex in the sense that the nexus doesn't necessarily mean that you have multiple flows of funding it often happens it's all coming in one way or the other from the same pot of funding and therefore while it is distributed across different types of actors based on different types of principles when it moves from a humanitarian to a development to a peace actor it doesn't necessarily mean that we get more of the funding and so while yes we need to approach each other and try to work together there is never a clear cut i now hand it to you and i go home we have to find a way for us all to be able to say, okay, we're gonna work in parallel until we find a way that one or the other can, can take on the, the necessary actions and that the necessary funding is made available. So we try to take all of those uh, discussions, integrate them into the national development plan and say, yes, protection needs. Yes, we need to uh, meet these needs from a humanitarian perspective, but we also need to put them into the national development plan, the local development plan. We need to ensure that the institutions who are according to the state have the mandate to carry these rights and to ensure that they are met actually are given the capacity to do so. So we've worked quite closely with the Ministry of Planning, for example, to ensure that these concepts are also embedded within the national system. That brings me to the, the point on collective outcomes. We do have a set of defined collective outcomes in the country. I think if you ask the 100 participants uh, that have been part of the workshop and the process that followed, they're all going to give you very varying opinions on if this was functional or not. I think the process is for us has been more important than the final outcome. We already have existing plans. The humanitarian community works under the HRP. The development community works under the PNSD and the National Development Plan. We have our peace actors who are hugely involved, of course, in the transition planning of MONUSCO and the phase out of the mission. Each and every uh, part of the system has their own plans. And to add a layer of collective outcomes was perceived by some as overly bureaucratic, by others as an extremely valuable process. So we have decided that the collective outcomes are important, the process gave us a lot, but that the most effective way to actually track these collective outcomes was to make sure that they are embedded into the plans that each side of the, 
each pillar of the nexus actually follows already. And just to give you some more concrete examples, developing collective outcomes is a huge process of compromise. Not everyone is always going to be happy with the results. Um, and I don't think anyone is asking everyone to be happy. And I think that is one of the conclusions that we, that we came to here is that we're not about creating one project, one program that everybody is happy with. As Sweden, we are not in any way looking to fund a Nexus project. We are looking to make sure that there's a dialogue between our partners that allows us to report against a higher level result that we are accountable for. And in the same way, if we can embed the collective outcomes in the existing plans of the three pillars, in the HRP, in the National Development Plan, and in the Peacekeeping Mission Plans, then they are accountable to report against those outcomes, just like their humanitarian partners or colleagues or development colleagues, without feeling that they have to make compromises on the work that they do. So we can still do what we're good at doing. We just need to find out how we build towards a common or collective goal and outcome, if you want. It is important when you talk about collective outcomes. I had a long discussion with colleagues at UNHCR and the protection cluster about this recently. If you define collective outcomes to meet needs, you are not going to succeed. Because the way a humanitarian meets a need is very different to the way a development partner meets a need. And so, and so what we have come to conclude is that, I, I do see that we're over time, I just have two more sentences to say. What we've come to conclude is that if you talk about the root causes, everybody can get on board. If you talk about how to meet the needs, then we're all going to have different approaches to do so. And then collaboration becomes much harder. And just to give one final concrete example of that, when you talk, for example, uh, and that's of humanitarian need and way of, uh, my examples are perhaps not so protection oriented, but basically it's to look at the root cause of the need, not so much the actual um, need in itself so that you address it long term. I think that uh, is uh, in summary what we've learned from here and it's in summary what we are trying to pursue as a donor within the Nexus donor group and um, thank you very much. Thanks Kirsten, that was really interesting and I think the, um, the experiment uh, in DRC or the experience in DRC is really um, interesting and important for everyone to have a look at. Um, there's been a lot of learning, a lot of good learning along the way. Um, moving on now uh, to the IESC, um, the results group four under the IESC um, is about the nexus um, and it's critical in advancing the nexus thinking amongst humanitarian actors. To do that, of course, um, results group four has to reach out to others and the group has strong links and regular joint discussions and events with donor groups such as the International Network on Conflict and Fragility and with other groups inside the, the UN system. We have a broad um, uh, membership that is also uh, not just humanitarian actors, but also development and peace actors as well. This, of course, is the nexus in action, at least at global level. Um, now I'd like to hand you over to, to Marta, who is the, my co-chair of Results Group 4. She's the humanitarian director at Oxfam, and she's going to talk to us about the ISC's new guidance on collective outcomes. Hi. Uh, thank you, uh, Rachel, for the, for the presentation. I will share my screen very, very briefly, and I will try to be very brief. As, um, can you see my screen? Yes? Oh, because... Yes. yes perfect. Yes, good. good. So, um, I'm going to introduce to you the Light Guidance on Collective Outcomes. That is a product of the resource group number four that was uh, endorsed by IASC uh, in June. No. I'm wondering if it's my connection or if it's hers. I don't know if you can continue. I don't know if you can complete us on that. 
no, I cannot say anything. So, uh, I apologize for that. Hi, Marta. Um, Sophia here. You're breaking. Yeah. Um, can you try maybe to switch off the video for the time uh, being and uh, we see if it goes uh, it's better. Thanks. Yeah, I will try to, but I can. Oh, okay. I cannot see my screen, in fact. That no, is, now uh, we can hear you, Marta. Go ahead. We can hear you. Now you can now. hear me. Okay. So this is coming back. Okay. So um, as I'm showing my screen, we developed in uh, last year, in June, we developed the live guidance to collective outcomes. That is a guidance that was, uh, that is the result of um, a long process of consultation. Um, okay, so we, <laughs> it is very challenging. Okay, now, so is the, is the result of a long process of consultation with different actors, yeah? Uh, and it's a, it's a document that is responding to a need that has been expressed by uh, field colleagues and HQs, uh, HQ colleagues, and uh, instead of developing a new guidance and a very uh, top-down document with a recipe for the nexus and for the development of collective outcomes, we thought that it was going to be much better to have a long consultation with colleagues uh, and we ensure a consultation with more than 40 people, uh, country base and HQ base, in order to discuss about what was expected for the guidance. I'm not going to go, as I said at the beginning, into the details of what you can find in the guidance. I just want to open the interest from your side in, uh, in checking the guidance and the content, but it is developed in a way that I really enjoy the presentation about ERC, because the guidance is giving uh, choices around key questions about the why's, what, when, who, and how, around different steps. So when we work on collective outcomes, when we are trying to design or what we are trying to implement or to mainstream, the document is giving choices and pointers on things that need to be considered to ensure that we move into the nexus. It is developed in a way as well that will help uh, developing the knowledge um, dimension and will help into the development of the capacities of the staff. We know that working with a nexus approach is a big change in terms of culture, and that means that we need to change attitudes. And this is why the guidance is not a recipe, but it's a flexible way in order to get adapted. And, uh, and it's a live document. So we launched it uh, in June. We are just in the phase of implementing, and uh, we hope to learn and to be able to share some experiences. As I said, it is directed, the audience of the document is mainly UN, uh, RCs, HCs, and RCOs, but as well other UN and NGOs, agency heads, field practitioners, donors on the field, and program and project managers. Uh, there are some points that are quite important for this collective outcomes like guidance. That is the fact that there are some prerequisites in order to work on the nexus and to define collective outcomes is the fact that we need to have the right people sitting at the table. So doing collective outcomes, only having development or only having peace or only having humanitarians is not going to work. We need to ensure that everything is uh, built considering what is the knowledge and what are the capacity gaps, that we are flexible in the way we are approaching the work and this flexibility is as well framed in the area of the funding and, and donors are sitting around the table. Just to close uh, <laughs> this uh, complicated presentation, uh, let me tell you a little bit and let me give you a grasp of what you can find in the document. So as I say at the beginning, the document is framed around eight steps in relation to the collective outcomes. And in, in each step, you will find pointers and choices in relation to key questions. So, for example, one of the questions that we hear from the case in DRC was about uh, stakeholders and how important the process was. If you take a look into the step number two of the light guidance, you will find key questions and pointers around convening stakeholders. Questions related to who should be uh, convening, uh, who can, should be invited, how to ensure that the affected population is as well. Uh, feeding into the process and so on and so forth. And the same will be found in other processes to finalize with the mainstreaming on how we can use the collective outcomes 
in order to fit different planning processes like the cooperation framework, but as well HRP and, and others. Yeah. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we define that through eight steps, yeah, and in a flexible way through questions. And you is there is not a need to use the guidance in a linear approach. Does it mean that if even in a country that has not gone through an initial first step, can I start looking at the guidance on the step number four when, for the formulation of the collective outcomes or even for implementing collective outcomes, even if the process to be defined has not been following the guide? We think that this is flexible and we think that the most important thing is on how we approach the work around the nexus. Yeah. So this guidance uh, can be found in the IASC webpage. It's quite short, it's 17 pages. That was quite important. We hear from the field, they need to have very uh, brief documents and adapt it to the reality. Uh, and please read it, uh, test it, and, uh, and you can share with us your feedback that will be more than welcome. I think that I will stop here and I really apologize for the problem with the computer. Many thanks, Marta. No, it was, it was very good. And thank you for that overview on the light guidance and collective outcomes. And I'm, I'm sure we will share that PowerPoint with the participants online. And now without further ado, I would like to also now bring in, um, Marta, can you stop sharing the screen? I'm so trying. So um, I'd like to introduce our next, um, our next participants and speakers, they will share with you the Somali example. So Kristen Arthur is a protection cluster coordinator from, based in Somalia, and Teresa Del Ministro is a durable solutions coordinator with the UNRCO's office. So over to you, Kristen. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Um, for that introduction and colleagues, um, hello, and hope you enjoy the presentation today. Um, so as, as a protection cluster coordinator, um, I've had the pleasure of working in both uh, Ethiopia and Somalia uh, closely with durable solutions working groups. So I wanted to just talk to you briefly about key areas of engagement that um, I have experienced as a cluster coordinator. So um, just a few bullets on the screen. So obviously active participation in the Durable Solutions Working Groups. Um, it is a completely different structure that requires um, uh, quite active participation in order to understand the differences between uh, Durable Solutions and um, the cluster approach, if you will. Um, both in Ethiopia and Somalia, we, I've experienced strong Durable Solutions coordinators. Um, which is obviously very helpful um, within the RCO's office. And, um, you know, my perspective is that engaging with the Durable Solutions Working Groups is a good opportunity um, to communicate and establish uh, relationships with other key stakeholders, also development actors, and donors that are funding these types of development initiative, similar to what the colleague mentioned from DRC, um, usually the same donors, potentially different focal points, um, or the conversation is obviously different um, when you're discussing durable solutions initiatives. Um, so also ensuring a protection lens to the durable solutions initiatives, I think is the key role um, that the protection cluster and protection colleagues can bring. Um, and also highlighting the need for the expertise of the AORs, um, particularly HLP, um, but also child protection and GBV um, will play an important role in any of these initiatives that are um, moving forward in a country. So also the second bullet regarding like capacity building initiatives, um, this was a best practice from Somalia that we were trying to, to initiate and organize in Ethiopia, um, organizing durable solutions, uh, capacity building sessions for cluster members. Um, because I think generally speaking, as, as uh, protection cluster members, we don't have the same jargon, the same understanding as was highlighted 
um, earlier by colleagues, also a different perspective on needs, uh, potentially root causes, um, these types of um, differences of, of, I think, theories or practice are important to highlight in order for us as protection actors to um, come to the table um, within durable solutions initiatives. Um, so also um, examples of collaboration on guidance documents and strategies, of course, holding joint missions, assessments, analysis, um, also working together on relocation and return initiatives. Um, this is both the case in Somalia and um, Ethiopia. My colleague Teresa will talk about um, an initiative in Somalia next. Even co-chairing task forces together as durable solution and protection. Uh, that's an example from Somalia. Ratification, domestication of the Kampala Convention. These are, this is an example from both countries as well. They both ratified the Kampala Convention and in the process of domesticating. Um, this is just another example of how I've worked closely with the Durable Solutions Initiative, um, given that domestication of um, IDP law or policy is obviously core to protection as well as durable solutions. And then um, inclusion of durable solutions in the objective mm -hmm. of a HCT protection strategy. Um, that's also something to consider as well as um, including durable solutions in the protection cluster strategy. So I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Teresa, to take you through the next slides. Over to you, Teresa. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. All right. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, so um, thank you, um, Chris, and for this uh, comprehensive view of our collaboration. The examples that we've brought to you today um, zero in on a particular aspect of our collaboration that we feel has exemplifies very well how um, considerations on collective outcomes as well as mainstreaming protection into those outcomes uh, comes to life uh, really um, in a, when we have the opportunity to carry out relocation programs. So uh, we have two examples today from um, um, Bar Baidoa in, uh, in an area called Barwako and Mogadishu, Somalia. And, and this initiative, when successfully completed, are meant to be a direct contribution to collective outcomes that were established by uh, the UN and international community in 2017, um, primarily within the remit of the humanitarian response, but they are now being revised to become part and parcel of the UN Sustainable Development and Cooperation Framework. Um, these relocations have involved also a variety of partners really across the humanitarian peace and development nexus. And uh, uh, another key tenets of um, the new way of working is bringing in the comparative advantage of this uh, various stakeholders uh, to ensure that a, a, an approach that is holistic is taken to uh, ish, the issue at hand. And in, in our case, it's really a successful reintegration of displacement affected communities. Um, the final aspect, of course, is the um, multi year nature of these processes and relocations we felt were a good example because, in some cases, particularly for Baidoa, those have become part of long term. Uh, urban development plans, city extension plan that the municipality has approved. So next slide, please. So here you can see um, Baidoa. Um, um, Baidoa uh, on, the, on the left slide uh, has um, experienced mass displacement following the drought of 2016-17. Uh, the size of the town almost tripled during that time and uh, uh, you can see the distribution of settlements on the left hand side of the slide. On the right hand side of the slide you can see uh, the new site, Barwako, it's a city extension um, at the northern outskirt of the city and uh, it's been big portion of land that was allocated by the government 20 square meter large um, Sorry, kilometers large, and uh, this um, uh, this site uh, has been uh, uh, really looked at with uh, a lot of interest by protection partners and durable solutions partners because of its proximity to uh, areas that are not yet 
safe. So the collaboration with protection, the protection class has really brought about and created a, a compelling case for the partners that are working on the project to really uh, take into account the security and safety dimension, the do no harm principle, and a thorough risk assessment was rolled out. It concluded that it was uh, safe to uh, relocate the households and now um, the first pilot has been concluded. 1,000 households have been relocated and um, the target is 4,000 households. All these households were at risk of forced eviction, so that is also not a protection element. And um, in the collaboration with partners, we have uh, uh, acted together under the leadership of the government to bring in also urban resilience, urban development partners that are working on roads to connect the new site and transform it into a city extension. Um, there is a plan in place as well to match development funding with a new joint program uh, coming in called Samayenta, that means impact. And uh, Samayenta is uh, aimed at generating a sustainable financing for service delivery. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, these are the details I've just talked about and we can go to next slide. Great, so here, uh, is the second example is a process at the early stages of the collaboration. Um, so we are looking at a site in uh, Mogadishu city that hosts uh, uh, approximately 5,000 individuals protracted displaced. The government, uh, due to protection concerns related to security, has requested help from the partner, partners to relocate the, the households into another site. And here the collaboration with protection class has been fundamental to capacitate the government in carrying out profiling and assessments. Um, and on the durable solution side, we have brought together the main actors and partners in Mogadishu to try to see how this process can be better supported. So um, this is another example of a government-led process uh, that entails a substantive number of individuals and where the protection element is key uh, at several stages of the process to guarantee that First off, the government abides by principles of um, due process and when it comes to relocation. And secondly, that all security and do no harm considerations are uh, taken into account. Um, oh, next, and over to Christian. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Um, um, next slide, kindly. So just, just some key protection considerations. Teresa really covered a lot of where the uh, protection cluster or protection colleagues um, were critical in the Durable Solutions Initiative, that example of relocations. But of course, we want to look at voluntariness um, of, the, of the return relocation or lo local integration also or organization of the return or relocation, making sure that um, family unity is maintained. That's an area that, that I think is a strong um, point for advocacy within protection. Also, of course, safety and dignity um, without discrimination. I believe Teresa talked about that, as well as um, how we can contribute with the conflict or protection or HLP assessment. Um, I see that this is also critical um, in our role within a durable solutions initiative to contribute um, in those assessments, particularly conflict and housing, land, and property. Um, next slide, please. So, um, of course, also um, advocating for a participatory approach. Um, decisions should be voluntary, um, self-determined. Obviously, there's also, there's always different um, concepts around consent if it's a, at a community level or an individual level. Um, so that's something that protection will, um, will look after or advocate. Um, go and see visits, of course, providing logistical support, ensuring that persons with specific needs um, are included in those visits. And then protection by presence and monitoring. Um, that can be also post um, relocation, ensuring that protection actors are there to monitor the situation also with the host community um, and, and the availability of, of resources. 
um, because conflict can, of course, happen um, later on after the relocation or return. So that's it from my side. Obviously, there's more protection considerations, but um, those were the key ones that came out of the example highlighted by my colleague, Teresa. So thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you so much, Teresa and Kristen, um, for that great example um, from Somalia on how the protection cluster is working closely with development actors. Um, so now, because we're a bit late, um, we're going to have the, the breakout sessions. And I would like um, to, to first describe, so we're going to have five breakout groups. Um, so I, I need to remind everyone, so there are five groups, there'll be two facilitators, one facilitator, one note taker for each group. I believe they know who they are. Um, there'll be um, two groups, one group, group three will be in French. So those online, um, if you could put number three, if you would like to be in the French group, put number three before your name. So you go to the participants, go to your name and put number three there. And for those that would like it in a Spanish speaking breakout group, please put number five in front of your name. I hope everyone knows how to do that. And please, Farnaz, can you please put the, the, the jam boards? Because we will be using the jam boards for this. Could you please put that in the chat? Okay, so the note takers um, will use the jam boards. Uh, they, they, they know how to use that um, during your session. And we will go into these sessions for the next 30 minutes till 4.15. And then because of the, 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 a bit of a delay, we won't have a break and we will go into plenary with Rachel. So yes, so now we will please go to your breakout groups. Um, those that went in French, please put number three here in front of your name. Um, and those that would like Spanish, put number five in front of your name. Thank you. Is he back? I think they're still working on it a bit, Rachel. They should be back okay. soon. Um, so everyone else, just be patient. Um, if in the meantime, um, you want to think up a few questions for uh, the uh, speakers in the beginning, I'm going to hit them with a question. So please put something in the chat if you'd like to ask a question. Thank you. Rachel, I think most people should be back. Over to you for the, the reporting back. Thank you so much. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you've had some tremendously interesting conversations and uh, able to get out some of those issues, those pressing issues that you're seeing on the ground. So um, now is the time to discover what you've been talking about and share with everyone else. While we're hearing back from the rapporteurs from each group, if you have questions that you would like me to uh, send to some of the speakers at the beginning um, of, our, uh, of our discussion, please put those down in the chat and I'm going to choose some to go to the speakers. If you don't, I have some evil backup ones. So um, if you want to be nice, put something in the chat um, while this is coming back. Um, so, uh, let's hear back from the first group, group one, uh, which was uh, moderated by Angelica and notes by Jim. 
Um, who who's reporting back from that? I think I can do a little bit of the reporting, and Jim can um, assist me as well. We had some very good discussions, and um, it was clear from everyone that it's still a lot of uh, capacity development needed, both on development side and for humanitarian clusters on how to work together, the language around what are um, durable solutions. It was also evident that not all cluster leads get a seat at the table when collective outcomes are decided upon in a country. And you have to ensure that you actually have access to the process to be able to influence. We had some good examples from Iraq where they have used the child protection minimum standards to work both with government and local authorities and other actors to roll out these and in that way also enhancing protection throughout the work in Iraq. Uh, Jim can also help me now because there's a lot of information that came in and they're luckily all on the board so we can continue looking at them yeah so there was there was some quite practical things just about language that was used and um so yeah the iraq example of uh, uh, the arabic um child protection minimum standards so that was you know quite a practical oh, wow. thing um a few examples around yeah this need for capacity building around you know how to just engage know what the jargon is know what the structures the thinking behind um develop durable solutions from a protection side and vice versa um there's some bigger challenges around the neutrality issue of uh, you know our humanity nervous sometimes to be more involved with those that are working close, closely with state institutions. How do we maintain that neutral space? Is that an issue that we're, we're facing? Um, and that kind of links into other um, scenarios where, for example, uh, an example from Ethiopia that um, there might be a framing of some issues as humanitarian and emergency rather than uh, longer term development issues and that might prevent them being put in the longer term planning processes. So, so there was a how do we actually uh, get them to think differently around that. Um, yeah, so that would be for us. Yes. And lastly, if I may, from group one, was also that, um, that we had... Um, sorry, Angelica, sorry. Um, yeah. If you're not speaking, can you please mute? We, we hear all your background noise. Thank you so much. Please continue. I was going to speak, actually, so I don't know if there was a background from someone else somehow. Because I mean, okay, sorry. So I was saying there's some good examples that came out is when you work, for example, in the health sector, you can in the sector ensure that protection is enhanced. And unfortunately, when we talk about sexual abuse, there's also a strong need and similar kind of support needed, both for humanitarian sectors and development in the same context. Okay, over and out, I think, for group one. One final point just to, to share, just was that there was some, um, it was shared by a couple of people that when you actually have real positive leadership to bring the different areas together, so an example from Afghanistan on, you know, workshop bringing together um, sort of humanitarian development piece actors was really helpful. A uh, great way to get actors talking when they might otherwise not do. But but the challenge, if the leadership change does that, is that then maintained? And a quickly, just an example as well from, Uganda of just uh, when you're in a country that's dealing with uh, humanitarian sort of crises from neighboring countries um, just how to make sure you have that parallel development continues for the host communities as well as the humanitarian assistance to those who are refugees and have been displaced so making sure that there's a uh, communication and good parallel working there is really important. So thanks so much, um, Group One, and we're going to share all these jam boards, I think, at the end, so everyone will get this input. But it's interesting what you're saying about, you know, knowing what jargon and structures. We often talk about the fact that we're not trilingual. You know, we don't speak the same language across the nexus, and that's a big barrier. So that's interesting to bring that out, as well as leadership and things. But good to see some uh, some positive examples as well, and, and really useful to share those. Can I call on Group Two now? That was Dahlia and Julian. 
Hi, it was me, it was me and Dot actually. Dorothy was helping um, out, so I'll let her add. But I, I'm going to take the liberty of summarising a little bit. We had good examples from Ethiopia, Somalia, Chad. Uh, but what was coming out is that we're often building protection in, or, or our perspective is that we're building protection in, and whether that's child protection, HLP, mine action, um, or GBV, into ongoing processes that involve collective outcomes. And so, I mean, some of the discussions about how, so that was capacity, whether capacity building or having um, uh, discussions, uh, advocating to make sure that protection actors were included in uh, durable solutions processes or similar. Um, there were examples of having joint missions where actors would come together. So I think it, it, the idea is to have more of that and less, so more uh, working together from the outset. Um, more, again, uh, of course, the point of jargon came up, but we agreed that it was about having a common understanding. So sometimes looking beyond what each of our uh, our uh, descriptions of things were from the different um, different systems and just thinking what are the what, what are we coming together to do and what is our common understanding of the outcome or the objectives that we have and that includes really linking the emergency response and the longer term response knowing that have we do have to work with uh, governments and authorities and any um hesitation to do that is not uh, shouldn't be an excuse not to do it. Should be we should really be thinking uh, of sharing experiences and working together to 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 make sure that we are able to do that as humanitarian and development and peace actors. Um, so I think that's everything. Dorothy, was there anything else? Please feel no, free just, to add. I just think what was really striking was just how restrictive it is um, us not having this commonality across language, um, especially when we are trying to influence outcomes with with people outside of um, of the humanitarian development nexus. So with with governments and duty bearers, I thought that was really came across really clearly. Yeah, thank you so much, thank Group you. Two, and a, a lot of uh, similarity with the findings of Group One, which was really interesting to see as well. Um, Thanks for that. Yes, this, this language thing is certainly coming up, isn't it, um, as something. Maybe we need a trilingual dictionary or something that we can work on going forward. So um, let's have a think about how we can uh, work on that to help enable our results on the ground. Look at you, monkey. Like... I'm going to pass to group three now. Um, uh, just a reminder before I do, stay on mute if you're not talking. Um, if we hear someone in the background, could you mute yourself? Thank you. Um, uh, and I'm going to pass to group three, a reminder that we need questions in the chat as well at the same time. The group three was Christelle and Maggie, please. Do I have group three? Yes. Can you see me and hear me? Very well, thank you. Go ahead. Brilliant. So we had um, a few colleagues from Somalia, Central Rep uh, African Republic and Mali who contributed and we also had colleagues from the global level. Uh, so in terms of the first question, uh, the colleague from Somalia said that the uh, HCT's um, uh, protection strategy really helped to identify collective outcomes, uh, for instance, durable solutions for IDPs in Somalia and helped uh, different actors to work together. Uh, so, so let's not uh, forget this uh, wonderful HCT protection strategy that we've been developing in uh, across the world. They can help us to identify collective outcomes. Um, and also, uh, there were some specific topics where there was apparently in Somalia a good collaboration between the peace mission, which has a, uh, a human rights uh, uh, department and, and also a, a department working on civil affairs and working closely with the humanitarian issues to resolve uh, specific problems. Also co collaboration related uh, to justice or rule of law and inclusion. Uh, so that's for the, the first question. Maybe moving on to the second question. So for the second uh, question, we had um, uh, interesting, uh, I think, feedback from our colleagues from Mali who were saying the problem is that sometimes we don't even know uh, what the other's mandates are. So this really undermines collaboration. And this, uh, this came uh, also from, uh, from Somalia and other colleagues saying we spend so much time doing HNO and HRP that we don't really have space 
to look at uh, you know what are other networks do doing uh, and and we could spend a bit more time also engaging with the civil society and and uh, and making sure that social services are available uh, there was also this idea that um, the humanitarians uh, tend to focus, uh, to fill the gaps and sometimes because there's no social services or no development actors, instead of focusing the humanitarian action on life saving, they do put a lot of protection services now in the, in the HRPs. Um, Concerning the, the nexus, there was also a comment that humanitarians some, sometimes we cannot even agree on what the nexus means. And this, uh, this problem, we need to try to get, uh, get to a better understanding of, of what, what that means if we're going to uh, take it forward. Um, and and uh, yeah, people just uh, work in their area without really uh, collaborating. And what we need to change is we need to change the way we plan the, 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 and the way we finance uh, you know, uh, uh, humanitarian development and peace action, the fact that it's so compartmentalized leads to competition instead of collaboration. Uh, so that's another area uh, we would like to, uh, to change um, and also make, uh, make the planning a little bit more flexible. Uh, there was another comment is that the area-based approach is, is quite promising because it helps different fo actors to focus on problem so solving in a very specific uh, context. And, and the example that, uh, that uh, the colleagues from Somalia presented at the beginning of, of the workshop uh, were uh, excellent e examples. Um, I hope I haven't forgotten anything. Um, I've also put some notes in the chat box and maybe if, I don't know if any colleagues want to add maybe later. Merci beaucoup à la group 3. Um, thanks for that, uh, Group 3. Um, interesting to come out with the language question again. Um, and uh, the financing question, that's interesting as well. I think that, we, you know, the IASC and also other groups, um, so the OECD as well, are working on a paper on financing for the Nexus um, that's coming out in a couple of months. Um, so uh, I think that'll be really useful and, and help guide, us, guide our thinking in that, but that's certainly a question that we need to, to be better at. Um, and and um, I've, I've often wondered, wondered if it, we don't need to do a development for dummies kind of about how development works as well, because it's a little bit different to the way that humanitarians operate and the architecture is different as well. So maybe that's something we can think about going forward as well. But super good, um, super excellent re reflections. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I still don't have any questions in the chat box, um, but in the meantime, let's move on to group four um, with Yasmin and Sam. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, uh, I, will, I will give a summary and colleagues also uh, who are with us in group four, feel free to compliment afterwards. We had very interesting discussion and examples about how to ensure protection is included in collective outcomes. And I echo very much the findings of, um, of group two on how we find that uh, some lessons learned and good examples is really about how do we build protection in. Uh, so, for example, engagement with the durable solutions um, task forces uh, in Iraq and the ability to, to comment on the durable solutions strategy in the country uh, helped uh, strengthen linkages between humanitarian and development actors. We've also spoken about the ACT protection strategy in Iraq and how it included an objective, um, clear objective on durable solutions, which fa facilitated these um, linkages. Uh, an important point on willingness from the leadership to implement uh, such strategies is crucial for reinforcing these linkages and making them real on the ground. Uh, another example also is how um, uh, we need to focus on root causes uh, rather than humanitarian needs, which, which is a way to bring together everyone around the table to address uh, to address uh, the, the needs basically and work towards and achieve to uh, protection outcomes. Uh, a challenge here was also faced in terms of flexibility between the various uh, frameworks is, is very much needed, echoing also what group three uh, mentioned. Um, in terms of uh, uh, colleagues from, uh, from Syria also uh, 
raise a very good point on the importance of uh, working on protection indicators uh, and maybe changing the language of, of uh, protection indicators to, uh, to appeal to other protect, non-protection actors, including development actors uh, and peace, peace actors as well. Uh, we've had very interesting examples also from South Sudan, um, in, echoing also what Iraq mentioned in terms of working with Global Solutions Group, uh, working groups in the country, um, uh, developing uh, intention surveys on post-return, conducting mo monitoring, ensuring accountability to the affected op population. So these were all entry points and um, ways of working with uh, peace actors in, uh, in South Sudan. Involvement also in various uh, advocacy papers and initiatives uh, with peace actors was also a very good entry point on working together towards collective outcomes in the country. Uh, we've mentioned random examples from operations during the discussion, uh, including on Ukraine and how they worked also on capacity building with development actors on, on what protection is and what protection mainstreaming is and how do we, what does actually a protection risk uh, mean to, to bridge the gap between both actors. Uh, we've also spoken a bit about area-based approaches um, uh, to in the identification of needs and how it's a way also to bring together the various actors around one table. Colleagues, please pre feel free to complement what I mentioned and Sam as well. Anyone want to compliment? I thought that was a pretty good summary, but maybe there's some extra. No? Thanks. I mean, you, you've raised some excellent points, I think, in that in, in group four um, about this need to refocus, uh, particularly on the root causes of needs and maybe to phrase things in a way that that appeal or, or that everyone understands. Um, you know, the nexus itself um, is about uh, refocusing on ending need rather than meeting need. So um, it's interesting it, and it's interesting to see how durable solutions, which I guess was it was originally all about ending need for refugees. Right. Um, so, in fact, a durable solutions uh, probably has some very good learning um, for the nexus itself, um, given that you were one of the early adopters, I suppose, of, of the nexus approach. Um, let me just then um, move on to the last group, which I think was the Spanish group, um, and that was Marta and, um, and I'm not sure who, but Marta Julian. and somebody. Yeah, Julian, but it was only in Spanish at the end because uh, there was uh, very, very few Spanish speakers, so we moved into English. Yeah, can, can you show the, the, yeah, that's it. So we had a very, very interesting conversation. We had a lot of examples on, on how we were moving in including protection in the in the collective outcomes um, and there were different cases because countries that were present were at different stages from cases like Venezuela where there is uh, an emphasis on training partners and uh, identifying different type of partners and what they are doing in relation to protection and how they can join forces for cases like Libya where they have had a nexus working group in the past and where UNDP has facilitated an engagement between humanitarian and development actors. So um, it is an engagement through some initial training or through a dialogue and a conversation. There was an interesting example as well coming from Niger, where through a conversation and a dialogue with donors, they identify very clearly the connections between the protection challenges and long-term interventions. And the case uh, shared was about how the work on youth employment can reduce further protection risks in, in humanitarian crisis. And it was a good case to build from. Uh, we had as well the case of Ukraine uh, and the fact that uh, the protection work has been done not, not only with humanitarians in the aid city, but as well it has been extended to development actors. And therefore the, the, protection, um, the protection priority, the objective in HRP and others is owned not only by humanitarian sector, but as well by development. And it's easier to move and integrate protection into collective outcomes. So it's about how the protection portfolio is owned. And again, the example of Iraq, but what I found very interesting is how the colleague from Iraq presented uh, from sharing 
from the protection cluster sharing the protection monitoring and how the protection monitoring has contributed to the definition of a strategy and components uh, in the durable solution task force. So that was kind of bringing at the same time processes together to allow uh, sharing of ideas. We discussed further on the blockers and enablers. Can you go to the next? Uh, yes, perfect. Yeah. And um, I mean, I will, I will identify those that are a little bit different from the other groups. There was a point that was identified about political sensitivity. And it's clearly the case in, in, in Venezuela, where some political sensitivity in a context that is highly politicized can generate some uh, challenges in relation to the protection uh, portfolio. Yeah. But as well, there were some other challenges that were very interesting related to the fact that there is not a common forum for development actors and humanitarian actors to come share, speak, discuss. Uh, the fact that planning processes follow different paths and different speeds and takes different time. Yeah. And it was as well highlighted that in some countries, uh, the, the funding is mainly focusing on, on humanitarian needs, that is the case of South Sudan huge displacement, a lot of needs, and the main part of the funding is dedicated to humanitarian. Therefore, there is not a lot of the space for development, and then the collaboration is, is very reduced because of this fact. There was a discussion about the donors, how they can uh, contribute and enable, or how they can uh, affect negatively the conversation. And there was uh, a point about donors sending a message about humanitarian and development actors coming together, but at the same time having different uh, funding work streams and asking whether a common funding stream will not help. And the final uh, is about what we have to change and do differently. There was a question about the language. I think that it was a very interesting self-reflection about we need to speak about protection differently because not in all the cases when we speak about protection, the rest of the actors understand what we're speaking about. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so there was uh, the, the finding the common language. And there was as well about the mutual understanding and, and to be willing to find this common ground. And then, then after there was a very specific suggestion about can we have a protection focal point uh, in all the development forums as well in order to ensure that this understanding, sharing of information and common ground is built in a, in a constructive and, and easiest way. That was it. Thank and you, Marta. That's a great feedback. Did you have any more? No? No, no, I was going to say because there were, there were some colleagues that were going to speak at the end, but then we got brought into the main room. I don't know if somebody wants to complete or adapt what I have said. It was a great group, by the way. Does anyone want to add anything to that feedback? No? Okay. Um, no, I mean, there's some very interesting points that came up in that one. Um, the one about the financing is interesting. Um, I, I don't think as humanitarians, you would want to have to be submitted to the quality controls um, and lengthy programming cycles and sign offs and restrictions of development finance. So um, pushing for um, pushing for a common funding stream would just make your funding slower, I think. So um, there has to be a better way, though, and that I think that's around uh, developing financing strategies, um, and that's certainly something we will think about. Um, we will think about later, but it's a big question and it's an important question, and we can't. We must have enablers, if you like, in the financing, and not um, and not things that are blocking us. Right. I've only got one question in the in the chat. So who am I going to give it to? The question is, um, in your experience, how do development actors want protection actors to get involved in developing and implementing? collective outcomes. And I'm going to give that question to Teresa. Teresa, are you here still with us? I am. I am, Rachel. Thank you. Um, did you, did you take that one? Very easy question, I must say. Thank you, Dahlia. So easy to, <laughs> to respond to. Um, I, I mean, I've worked with a developmental agency before uh, joining the coordination and still the coordination is affiliated to UNDP. And I do think that um, from a development partners perspective, what I've noticed over time in the practice is that there is an unparalleled knowledge in, among humanitarian partners, but populations and social change needed. 
uh, to really uh, be talking collectively about impact at scale and uh, social and political transformations in countries, which is what the collective outcomes ultimately support and what the nexus is all about, right? Um, so, if, from a development partner perspective, I would have uh, wanted to see uh, protection partners collaborating at that level. I do think that uh, on the part of the development partners, there's also not so much knowledge necessarily um, of, of the processes and wealth of information that comes from humanitarian partners. Uh, it's coming up. Uh, but I do think that the planning issue is a real one because we are sort of stuck. And while being stuck in the planning cycles that are still separate and now are being merged, but uh, now <laughs> we are um, we, we miss out on opportunity for engagement. So it remains uh, the engagement remains on an ad hoc basis. It, it rests on the willingness of people to make it work. Area-based approaches have found a nice way around things because they really force actors to come together and to figure out the solutions and, and therefore they engage their own respective planning processes, organizations and financing with the purpose of working on a specific target area. However, uh, this is not an, a methodology that is necessarily uh, systematized in our formulation of uh, joint programs, of planning and stuff like that. So. Um, I do think there is a welcome change. I do think that the UN Development Cooperation Framework has given an opportunity to humanitarian partners, mission partners, peace partners to really work uh, together following the principles of the new way of working. But we are yet to see how this is gonna uh, turn out in practice. And if this, the way in which we're doing it now will actually uh, contribute to that high level impact social and social change that we hope to achieve over. Thank you very much, Teresa. That was an excellent um, answer to that. As you said, very difficult question. All right, if you haven't got any more questions, I'm going to make some up. Um, my first question is to Kirsten. So Kirsten, are you online? Kirsten, are you still with us? No, Kirsten had to leave for Oh, shame. Okay, so let me pick on Marta next then. So Marta, from what you've been learning um, in the IASC results group four, what do we need to do now to help unblock some of the challenges around the nexus and enable this change, um, this change and different way of working? Over to you, Marta. Thank you, Rachel. So I think that, uh, that the first thing is to enable a conversation and then to demystify what do we mean by engaging, by collaborating, by, by sharing. I think that in general terms, uh, the nexus is considered uh, as a potential area that can generate a lot of stress because it is going to be uh, losing identities and losing know-hows, roles and functions. I think that we need to demystify that and we need to start a conversation when, when every actor and every sector is recognized from what is bringing to the table, but uh, not denying de facto the need of the other sector to come and, and work at the same time in order to, um, to work on the root causes. So I think that it is about demystifying, it's about recognizing the roles of others, it's about being flexible and, uh, and trying to understand that we can and we have to work together if we really want to bring solutions to the same, uh, to the problems that we have been facing for quite a long time. So looks very easy answer. It's very, very challenging to do because it's about a change in, in ways of working and it's about change in power dynamics. Uh, so uh, this is where it becomes very, very difficult recognizing who has the power in each one of the conversations and uh, how we have to tackle this conversation in order to make it happen. Thanks, Marta. I think that's a really important um, point, uh, especially around the power dynamics. And, you know, we should never forget that as a humanitarian community, the, the knowledge and the data and the information that we have about vulnerable people um, is critical for good development programming. So, you know, we have that power in terms of being able to take that data to the table um, or to name and shame them if they don't, if they don't do it. Um, Kristen, are you also still here? 
Yes, I'm still here. Oh, you sound worried. <laughs> so, so my yeah. last question to you then is, um, if you had a magic wand, what one thing would you change that would help um, help uh, protection be more integrated in an excess approach? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I know we're running out of time here, so I do think it 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 boils down to um, a capacity building request um, of protection coming from a protection cluster coordinator's perspective. Um, I think there does need to be more concerted efforts in ensuring that we have the right skills to tools, knowledge um, to come to the table um, on durable solutions and working with development actors because currently it's not really in our um, in our toolbox, if you will, in my perspective. So that that would be my 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 wish if I had a magic wand over. Thanks, Kristen. I think that's a critical issue and something I think we're going to need to work on going forward. So maybe perhaps um, we can work uh, between the IASC and the Global Protection Cluster to work on some of that capacity building. I'm going to hand back to Nancy now. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that and all of the colleagues online. There was very rich discussions and I had joined all the breakout groups. I'm gonna just quickly ask um, Farnaz, can you please put up in the chat box the evaluation? Um, I would appreciate just uh, two minutes um, of your time before we go to uh, the closing speech by Sophia Khatib Grundy, who's our deputy coordinator. Can we just, I'll put a little music to it and if you could just kindly fill that out. Okay, uh, I heard that my music might not uh, be appreciated by all, but now let's go to now our closing remarks and speech. Um, so I'd like to turn over to Sophia Khatib Grundy. She's our deputy coordinator for the Global Protection Cluster. Over to you, Sophia. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, everyone. Um, and thank you, uh, Marta and Rachel, um, for helping us shaping up this session. Uh, Kirstin for giving your perspective from, from DRC and uh, Christine and Teresa to share your experience in, uh, in Somalia. And to all of you for, for really engaging actively in this uh, breakout group. It's been really, really uh, interesting. So I don't want to keep you too long, uh, but a key takeaway from, from us. Um, I think the first one uh, is the, the common uh, conclusion that uh, we need these communities, these different communities, humanitarian, peace and security and development communities to uh, become closer, uh, to bridge the gap in terms of jargons, in terms of uh, frameworks or frameworks of reference that we are using, terminologies and planning tools that we are using. Uh, we need to bridge that gap uh, and that can be done by dialoguing uh, more closely, by involving each other in our respective uh, planning processes and uh, developing collective outcomes at country level can be a conduit for that to happen, can facilitate that uh, to happen. And we can leverage this collaboration to, to have a better collective outcome. There's a number of conditions for that to happen in a way that is uh, effective. And, and we had interesting feedback from uh, 
uh, Kirsty in, in the DRC. So one of the first one is I think to ensure that these collective outcomes build on existing uh, planning processes, national development plan, a local development plan, but also existing UN uh, plans. Uh, we talked about the uh, HPC, we talked about uh, the former UNDA for UN Sustainable Cooperation Frameworks. So really to use these existing tools um, to really inform the development of this collective outcome. And of course, for our community, the protection community, to really use the HCT protection strategies uh, or the cluster protection strategies as a reference point uh, to, to, to inform these collective outcomes. I mean, there's a lot of efforts and time um, put into identifying and prioritizing uh, protection priorities uh, in a country, in a, set, in a specific operation. And this can really help shape these this, this collective outcomes. Um, another condition, I think, is to have a, a common analysis and a common analytical framework and try to harmonize a little bit from the beginning, the way we look at, at problems. Uh, so this has to be coming from a conflict sensitivity perspective, protection sensitive, protection lens. Um, so if we have this common uh, analytical framework, we can then uh, come to a, a, a common or an aligned type of planning. We also talked about using uh, or adapting the way we are talking to each other. Uh, we know that development actors might not necessarily be sensitive to talking about the needs of, uh, of the population, but rather talking about root causes. Um, we know that the World Bank, when they come to the table, are more interested in poverty reduction or abating unemployment or building infrastructure. And we need to develop us as the protection community a way to engage with them that is attractive, that is understandable uh, for them. So I think that's an effort that, that we need to do, uh, making our protection analysis and, and, uh, and the narrative more um, understandable by, by non-protection uh, actors. I think we also need to um, align our, our tools. Uh, we talked about the planning tools. We talked about uh, our coordination structure, which needs to speak to one another, the UNCTs, uh, the HCTs, uh, and the mission, the peace missions. Uh, need to have commonalities somehow and we, we need to try to foster that, that engagement. This is happening on an ad hoc basis in, increasingly and we saw the good example of Somalia through this durable solutions platform where we have the protection cluster strongly engaged but also uh, development partners. Um, so we've got increasingly good exp experiences at, at field level and this needs to be uh, fostered. And finally we also need our, our development uh, colleagues to make sure that Protection actors have a seat around the table when these collective outcomes are being developed. Uh, in Somalia, after talking to Teresa and Kristin, we realized that yes, protection is taken into account, but the protection cluster itself was not necessarily directly involved. So I think more, more efforts need to, uh, to be made here for an intentional uh, participation of protection actors in, uh, in this discussion. So I'm going to stop here, but very good starting point for our discussion. Uh, um, and I think we all came to the conclusion, more needs to be done. We need to, to, to continue dialoguing um, and, and, and being more familiar with each other to ensure that uh, we all contribute to collective outcomes that have a, a, an effective uh, protection uh, nature and dimensions. So with that, I want to conclude. Um, thanks a lot, everyone, um, for your participation and hope to be able to continue this discussion at field level and at global level. Back to you, Nancy. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you for the closing remarks. And I, I'd like to thank again all of the co-leads, Rachel, Dahlia, Marta, Angelica, and Christelle, and of course, the key colleagues at the technical, Farnaz, uh, who works with us in GPC Opsel, and Bianca, as well as Melissa and Yvonne. Bianca works with the CPAOR. So thanks everyone for joining us for this really interesting session, and I hope we can continue working with our development and peace building actors uh, through the protection clusters and other actors at the field level. Have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Right. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sorry, actually, I think.